Epic fail, you loser. All right. Uh, thank you, Will Ferrell's the best. <laughs>
as an experience, if you could say like you do something and 95 times out of 100, it's going to be a, a, an overwhelmingly positive experience and five times out of 100, you know, it might be a bit annoying or a bit crappy or whatever, then they're pretty good odds. Yeah, and you get the the troll or the the whatever, but I, I mean that's that's also just life, hey. Like uh, you know, there's well, always for the ten the, the the ten positive comments, you're gonna get the one negative, and we dwell on that, and that's that sucks, but that's human nature. The most amazing thing for me about that is actually what it, the internet has taught me about ba being able to deal with that. Because obviously I've grown up in a, an area, like a life where you get direct public feedback from people all the time. And humor is one of the most subjective things. Yeah. Like it's, it, it's rare with any other job that like somebody thinks you can't do your job if they don't enjoy you doing your job. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody will say, you're not funny. You're not a comedian. Yeah. Like they don't, they don't say that. They might say to someone, "You're a bad sports player," or "You're a bad like you musician." But they don't go, "You're not a musician." Like, yeah. but with comedy, if they don't like it, I'm clearly a comedian. I've done nothing else with my life. I've made my living. I've you know bought a house. I've had a good career. Like making at least some amount of people laugh. Yeah. Now that that this person hates me, that's fine. But in the old days, you did get upset about that. But then you get on the internet and you realize, oh no, no, no. Like everyone is hated. Like yeah. there's not one person in the world who is so popular. Yeah. Like the minute you start seeing people go, "Oh, Louis C.K. shit," and I'm going, "Well, then people are just idiots." <laughs> Why <are> you? <laughs> you don't want to be liked by that, though. I I also think that like it's just, uh, yeah, that's that's crazy. And I was gonna say like with other jobs, you could be like. You know how does he keep his job it must be like nepotism or like who's he screwing or whatever like you can't do that you can't like go across the globe and, and sell it shows everywhere and be like nah he's shit i i hate well, him he's it's it's more that sort of thing of like that like rich hall the american comedian said of comedy that it's a joke by joke job job application and what he means by that is that you know like audiences laugh like this ha ha next ha ha yeah, yeah, next. yeah you know they're always assessing you you're always one. It doesn't matter like how many good reviews you've got. It doesn't matter how many awards you've won. Like you can't, you can't like tell a joke and then everybody doesn't laugh and you start bringing out trophies. It's like, no, come on, awards. <laughs> like you know, John Cleese once said something really nice about me. Why aren't you enjoying this yeah, observation? Yeah. And so yeah, okay. Oh well, the only thing I was going to say, like in, re in regard to the question you asked me initially, is that idea of you face failure in comedy every day. Like you are only one joke away from failing at any time, which is the thing that makes it the most amazing thing. But it also makes sense to me that when you want to talk to somebody about failure, I think there's rare jobs, like, you know, particularly other than comedy, there's some, but there's rare jobs where people go towards and embrace failure, particularly in their lives to develop material, you know, to come up with stuff. I'm essentially doing a show that's five stories, like it's an 80 minute show, it's five stories. And they all end in me failing in some way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But doesn't that, isn't that a great attitude? And something I sort of picked up when I was traveling to be like, uh, the best stories come from like when you're like, you when you're like, well, not always, but a lot of the time when you're like super scared, you think you're going to die and it's, you're like, I've got no money. Like I woke up in like the wrong hostel and it's like, <laughs> they are like the, the best stories. And there's something uh, I think about um, that huge hurdle and then getting over it and being like, look what I've done, even though it's, it's terrible. It's like, I survived. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, the amount of times where like when something terrible is happening, the first thing I grab is a pen, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I remember all this, yeah. like the ability to be able to channel like negative experiences into positive experiences, certainly something I think as well that, I mean, it, it, it's weird that we're really talking about this in the middle of my Melbourne show because it's kind of thematic to what I'm speaking about in general at the moment, which is this idea that our lives are not documentaries. Like, we don't remember our lives as every moment that happens. Mm -hmm. We choose to remember moments, some of them big, some of them small, some of them good, some of them bad, and however we weave those stories together, that's how we see ourselves. That's what we see our life as being. Yeah. And no one else sees our life in that, that exact same way. And to be honest, someone else could look at your life and get a whole bunch of other examples and make your life to be something else completely. Yeah. We're choosing time what we choose to take meaning from. So I think that we have a really conscious choice as people to go, well, 
do I, if I got something from this experience, if it gives my life meaning, then it's a good story. If I get nothing from it, then just let it go. It happened. You can't change the things that happened, but you can change how you remember things and you can change the lesson that you got out of things. And, and like as a comedian, I mean, that's something that I'm obviously doing every single day. So, but it's also something that I think about quite a lot. Yeah, that's so funny. Uh, like uh, a couple of nights ago, I was filming a, a comedy show and, uh, the, the comedian's like, and so I walked into a sex shop, you know, for the material. And I was like, right. that's such a, like that, that attitude. And I, I know you've said like countless times that, uh, you know, if you need to do something, if you need, if you need to write for a show, like it comes from life experiences, like getting out there. Like if you just sit down and be like, okay, it's like time to be funny. Like it's, you're not really making that magic happen. Yeah, I think it's like, I, I was talking to this about this with someone the other day and they were like, what do you think, What? what what's your style? How do you put the show together? And it was another comedian and I said, look, the, after 20 years, all I can say is whatever it takes. Like there's no one way. You just know what you've got to get and you've got to do it however you can to get there. And sometimes that is sitting in an office and sometimes that is reading the newspaper and sometimes that is watching the latest shows and having all those. But I often find that even none of those things fall into place until you get out into the world, into a scenario, and then you go, oh, yeah, this is where I can use that idea I have about climate change or this is where I can use that idea I have about you know the, the meaning of the way we remember things and, and where the stories have to be true for us to get many meaning out of those stories. This is actually a practical example of the thing that I was theorizing, you know, sitting in front of a desk or in a bedroom. It's not necessarily about like, um, you know, like sometimes I think, you know, walking into the sex shop, for example, yeah, yeah, to me, yeah. that's like, to me, that's too, almost like too, like he, I'm here for somebody. Yeah. 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 Whereas like, I like the things that happen, you know, when you weren't expecting it, when you were, you know, that day that you, forgot to wash your hands after you shot a gun at the LA gun range and you went through the <laughs> shot residue on your hands. Like I never expected that was, that's yeah. just me. Like if I got, if I thought I was going to get anything out of that day, I thought I would have got something out of being at the LA gun range and shooting the gun. Right. And that's such a minor part of a story that happens. Yeah. You know, that has like a, you know, finishing me, you know, almost getting arrested at TSA and, and, and none of that would have happened if I just sat at home and imagined that. You have to kind of be out there and in the world and, and see how the world works. Yeah. Do you, do you find what you just said, like, life is not a documentary? And do you find, like, uh, or have you found that, that trying to script that life, you run into issues? Because it's like, I'm trying to force this to go this way. And then yeah. that means you're blind to the opportunities coming along. And and uh, I've, I've certainly found that it's like, uh, I'll start this and it's like, wow, that really wasn't what I expected. But here's this fantastic opportunity that came off the side, which never would have presented itself if I didn't say yes to that. And, and sort of my first job in TV, um, that's like I said, I said yes to a driving gig. And then all of a sudden, like I had like a little little extra bit. And then from there, the, you know, the, um, the line producer was was going on to another show and you know like brought me and it was like just that weird like snowball and and it's like that steve jobs thing and i, I hate it because everyone quotes it but i also love it so i keep saying it but it's like connecting the dots looking backwards like that's the only way you can do it you can't say like oh i did this and this and this and this and so it worked out perfectly it's like well that kind of led to that and then that led to that and then all of a sudden i was in a great position to do that right they don't talk about yeah, the eight or ten times when, you know, you could have picked those same incidents and told a completely different story about Steve Jobs, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's absolutely true. In fact, in a lot of the way that we deal with our uh, lives, they say that our brains are lawyers, not scientists. And what they mean by that is that we often come up with the conclusion that we want to intellectually and then we look for evidence to support it. We don't actually look at all the evidence and then come up with a conclusion. And that's why we, you know, we all behave the way that we behave but I certainly think when it comes to your career well when it comes to my career because like you can never like speak for somebody else yeah. um, I often, they often say that you've got to know what you're running to or what you're running from and what I mean what they mean by that I think is that there are some people who have an ambition you know mm -hmm. I want to do this thing and then I will be happy once I've done this thing and maybe I'm willing to put up with being unhappy 
for years and years and years because I think when I get this thing, this thing will be so good that it makes up for all this time that I was unhappy. And that is an approach. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's the successful approach. It's certainly not the approach that I use. But it's an approach and you've seen people go that way and, and have success doing that. Mine's very much of the running from. I knew I didn't want to be a farmer. I knew I wanted to have a life that had some adventure in it. And after that, I really just worked hard and let it take me where it took me. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that if you enjoy it every day, if you enjoy the process of it, yeah. like every aspect of it, then like if I drop dead tomorrow and I don't get to that thing, whatever that thing would be, then I've still had a great life. I've been happy. Like I can be happy today. I'm going to go and do this gig tonight that I, you know, that I, was, that I was telling you about. It's one of my favorite gigs in all of the world. I love nothing more <laughs> than doing this gig, right? Yeah. It's just a great – and I'm a person who is at a point in my life where everything that's happened meant that I can go down to my favorite gig in Australia and I will all night. I don't have to do anything. I literally wander on and off stage whenever I want, talk, muck around, like have a ball. I've won. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. Like if you love what you do and what I've found is the more you love it, the more you want to do it, the more you're willing to put in those free hours, the more you're willing to – I mean I've bought in, I've built a new career myself um, I, from my podcast, TOEFOP, and yeah. all around the world people have found that. And like I – you know, it cost me money to do, to be honest, like mm-hmm. quite a bit over the year to be <laughs> honest, but I love it. Yeah. I, I do it I love it. I love it because it's my hobby, you know, yeah. and – but because I love it, you know, we put a, a, a live TOEFOP um, on at the Melbourne Comedy Festival mm-hmm. and it sold out in six minutes. Yeah. We felt like the Rolling Stones. It was like, <laughs> like I've, I've been quite successful in Australia for quite a long time and I've never sold out anything in six minutes. Yeah, like I've never, I've never done anything that people like that much that they were like, no, 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 we definitely have to. And that just happened by accident. That yeah. just happened because I was doing something. I, if I'd sat down t- three years ago or whatever when we started doing the podcast and thought, you know what, I'll aim for us by the time in three years' time we'll build this big enough that I can take it here and I can yeah. do this. It wouldn't have happened, I yeah. don't think. No, it just happened. You, you couldn't. And I think that's the – I'm trying to – as soon as you said it, I was like, that's the difference between goals and, and when you were talking about the process. I don't know what it is, but – um, it's something to do with that structure. It, rather than be like, I'm going to get to this weight, uh, goal weight, like a lot of people are trying to lose weight all the time. It's like, how about you try and make that your lifestyle, like to go to the gym every day? Because if you don't get to that weight, you're going to be chronically unhappy until you get to there. And maybe you get there and then like there's another goal. It's like, well, then I want my biceps to be like however big. Um, rather than enjoying it every day and enjoying the lifestyle, enjoying like it sounds so corny, but like enjoying the the journey, right? Rather than the the destination, also, which you never get to sometimes. Destination. Well, here's yeah. what I've learned: a lot of destinations too. Most of them are nowhere near as cool as you would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, most of the things that if you'd asked me when I was 15 that I thought would make me happy, I've done a lot of those things. Yeah, and I'm here to tell you that they are not the highlights of my life. Yeah, you know. The things that other people think are the highlights of your life are really the highlights of your own life. Mm -hmm. And I think that we would be a lot happier as people in general if we spent less time trying to live a life that we think other people think we should live and actually listen to ourselves and said, what is the life that I want to live? What makes me happy? Right? You know, and then genuinely give in to yourself and realize that sometimes that will mean that externally people might think, you're not as, like, I mean, for example, I'm doing less and less media work in Australia because I want to do more and more stand-up. Yeah. And sometimes if you meet someone who's not right across my career, they just think that no one's booking you on TV anymore or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least that Will Ennis has really dropped off the map. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and for most people, they don't know or care enough about you to, to pay attention so that it was my choice, not you know, the other way around. Yeah. And in this moment, you always feel a bit like you want to justify yourself or if you want to like be, oh, no, 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 it's still. Yeah. Look but at the this truth of it is, I chose what I'm doing mm-hmm. and I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. The Melbourne Comedy Festival is a good example. You'll have a lot of people who they have award, there's some awards at the end of the festival and, um, Everyone loves to win an award, don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, yeah. but you can, 
some people you know write these shows almost to like you know if i win an award it'll all be worth it but if i don't get nominated for the awards you know they're almost crushed like the whole month was a waste yeah. whereas my attitude is very much like i start with the process of going i want to write a better show than i have ever written before because that is the only thing that i can control i can't control how other people will judge it or whether they'll respond to it or they won't respond to it or, you know, whatever. I I actually don't have any control over that. And people are all different and audiences are all different. So even if I tried to, that would send me crazy. So instead, what I try to do is to control the one thing I can control is, is this a better show? Am I enjoying doing this more? Do I feel like a more complete comedian? And then I enjoy every night. Yeah. Like I'm, I mean, geez, it'd be great if at the end of the festival someone wanted to give you a trophy. But if they don't, I enjoyed every night and I had great shows and people got what they came for, which was to have a great night out. And so I think that you can get in your own way sometimes with, you know, yeah, it's good to have goals. I have goals. I have goals. That's a goal. I wanted my show to be better than it was last year. But that's my own goal that I can, you know, work on myself. Yeah, totally. And I think there's like... There's, there's having your own goal and then there's like having that goal that like uh, that you can talk to other people about and, and like you do, I think you do need to be like striving towards, uh, striving towards something. But yeah, at the end of the day, I always think it's really funny. It's like uh, when you compare like what you make, uh, what makes you happy um, to what other people think is success in your life, if, if that sort of makes sense, like... Uh, Yes. people will see they're like oh my god like um you visited that place and it comes back to travel as well but it's like you visit that place like that's awesome You're like no i had like a really shitty time but it, it like it looks like i'm having a good time because i'm smiling in, in front of like that monument or whatever and it's it's so funny that external happiness that other people sort of project onto you and then you're just there being like i actually like had the shits and like had a fight with my girlfriend and it was just the most horrible experience but here's this like beautiful uh photo of me in front of the eiffel tower you know like it's uh it is it's it is really funny although that. i think that we we project that as well i think it's both oh, sides yeah. oh shit yeah so yeah. You know, you look at how people curate their Facebook pages or what that image of themselves they give to the world. Yeah. And my friend was telling me a story. I was, I was at a wedding and this guy told me a story and I thought it was just so perfect and symbolized what was going on. He said there was this teen girl. She was out by the pool. He was working on the house and she was bored. Like she was just laying there bored, you know, clearly bored. She gets up. She takes out her phone. She like puts on the big smile, you know, shoots a selfie by the pool and then puts her phone back down and goes back to being bored. But the image he sent out to the world was, yeah. look at my fabulous life, I'm near a pool. And you, no wonder we feel so crappy about ourselves yeah. because like, we not only do we think we have to be as successful as other people, but other six people are faking how successful they are as well. You know, their, their relationships, their lives, we're all flawed. We, yeah. I mean, even the idea that I'm the same person, if we'd done this interview at 9 o'clock in the morning or if we'd done this interview at midday tomorrow, you know, I would answer these questions in slightly different ways because I'm a different person at different times of the day and I'm a, a different person. <laughs> Tomorrow I know 24 hours more stuff than I know today. And yeah. so we kind of put all this stuff out there. I, what I've been trying to do a lot in my work, and it comes back to what you're like doing with this, which is that idea of being able to talk about like failure, yeah. like the idea of publicly saying to people, it's okay to fail. In fact, I embrace failure. And what I mean by that is, like particularly when I was putting this show together, I did like eight hour length, completely improvised trial shows. And the only reason I could do that, I walked on stage with no, like no idea of what I was going to talk about and then talk for an hour, right? Did shows, yeah. eight of, eight different ones. And the only reason I could do that was I told myself that it was okay if I failed. Yeah. I told myself this doesn't have to be great. You're doing this to learn something. You're doing this knowing that chances are some of it, at the very least, will fail. And you're okay with that because it's going to make you a better person. And it's giving yourself permission to be imperfect that allows you to actually... Because I think that perfection is so often the enemy of people even trying, even yeah. start. Like the amount of times, you know, I mean, I'm, and I'm guilty of this. We're all guilty oh, of this. Yeah, but sure. the amount of times you haven't started something because, you know, you need to get it perfect. But you know that, well, just start it now. That's like at least... Even if I get a tiny bit done now, I am that much further closer to when I need to. But you, 
you get inside your own head and you can't start because you need it to be great. There's always those excuses. And, and like the, the funniest thing with uh, like investigating failure and doing it is like me failing at doing that, you know, like there's, it's, there, there's been like plenty of times where I've like, you know, gone off the rails with the project and it's like, it's just cause I, because I love irony so much. It's just like the biggest irony is like failing at doing this because you're supposed to be like the smartest person in the room about this, you know, like, and that's really hard for me to admit. And like, uh, I've, I've, I've written a couple of blog posts about it and I haven't put all of them up because again, it's like, feel them like, Oh, they're like, yeah, it's just not there. You know, it's, um, but that's such a big, it's a big flop, those excuses and not shipping because it's not perfect. My last podcast, like I just couldn't sync my interview up um, with Steph Brocci, but I needed to get it up for the fringe. And I was like, it's the first one. It's going to be out of sync. It like, it's not going to have like the intro wasn't working. It was just so much bad. There was just so much. I felt like bad juju about it, but I was like, it's got to, It's got to go up. And if I can't put up, you know, it, a little bit dodgy and be happy with it, then I'm like, I'm never going to be happy because, um, you know, it's never perfect. And I was going to say the other thing with perfection is that a lot of times people won't start, um, like you said, but then people won't finish either. It just, right. it just sits at about 80% and it's like, you know, it's, it's like, well, no, I'm just going to tweak it a little bit more. I just want to wait till I have a few more interviews lined up. I want to wait till like have a, my big thing is like, it's always been a better camera. It's like, ah, oh, I just, I'm sick of like shooting it and being crappy. And I just want it to like look better. And then I heard Ira Glass. Have you heard the little, the gap talking about the creative gap? It's like when you start, you're the tastemaker and that's why you're into this, whatever creative endeavor you're into. And there's that gap between where you know you want to be and you, you can be, but you just suck. You, but it's, and he says the biggest thing is you just have to keep doing it and just close that gap between where you want to be and where you're actually at. Right. Well, it's, I mean, it goes back to, you know, that the Malcolm Gladwell thing, you know, the 10,000 hours to yeah. get good at it. Like if you're going to have to do 10,000 hours, you might as well start doing them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, no zero know, days. Some of the yeah. best like it doesn't matter. It takes you ten thousand hours to get good. It doesn't matter if you wait like you know another three years. It still takes you ten thousand hours to get good. Yeah. So you might as well start the ten thousand hours now. The second thing that I would say that I would add to all this was just more my personal philosophy, and it does mean it depends what you're looking for, particularly in a creative endeavor. See, I'm looking for a life. Mm -hmm. This is as in like I want to be able to do this, be creative, and do projects that I enjoy doing for the rest of my life. Yeah. So some people don't want that. Some people just want to do one big thing, have it pay off and then, you know, buy a, you know, a gold gold house in the clouds or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, get a, a monkey butler. Yeah. And <laughs> but for me, I want to keep doing things. So yeah. my attitude has always been this. I have two really like things particularly when putting together material, which is the context that I view a lot of this through, but which is Firstly, I want it to be better than it was last time. I think that's a good, simple principle of like even as just even as being a human. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be a better human today. I want to be better at being a human. I want to be better at being in a relationship. I want to be a better friend. I want to be better with my workmates. I want to take all the knowledge I've accumulated up this point to be better, you know, at what I'm doing in general. Yeah. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is if I get it perfect, what am I going to do next year? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. The, the thing that gives me something to do next year is making it better than it was, you know, last year. Yeah. That's what, that's what I do for a whole year. I work on myself to be better than I was last year. Yeah. If I get it perfect, what do I do from then? But that's the, that's the, the trap of the goal as well. Like, once it's attained, uh -huh. like, uh, it's like, what next, you know? I think that's a really cool place sometimes to be to, to get there and be like well I've done that and and then you look out and and go again but but then I think it also gets harder because it's like all right I've, I've achieved this this is a level that I've set right and you know what if the next show like isn't as good you know what happens if you win like if you win the Melbourne Comedy Fest uh, what's what's the award I'm, I'm not across the top of that it's called the Barry the Barry that's it 
uh, if you get that, like, has anyone won it two years in a row? Like, that's just the, would they give it to you two years in a row? Like, what I, you... think, they, I think once you've won it, they, yeah. they you, it, buy it. you don't get to be in it anymore. Right, right. You just uh, put up a space. <laughs> but, uh, that's so funny before what you said. I didn't, I really didn't take many notes and, uh, or sorry, make, make many notes for the interview just because I, I didn't think we need it. But I did write down faking it in life. And it's so funny that you said it before, like, we're faking it, but, and I've heard you say it a couple of times that like, like no one's got it figured out in, in Will Osophy, it's come up pretty much in every interview. I feel in some way, someone's like, I had no idea like what I was doing or, you know, there's just that uncertainty, uh, in, in everyone, even if you're killing it, even if you're crushing, uh, along to that 10,000 hours, it's just, there's, there's points where you're like, someone's gonna, it's called imposter sy syndrome, actually, like someone's right. gonna, Someone's going to like burst through the door one day and just be like, you are underqualified to, to do this job. Like get out of here. But I think that that's, I mean, most people I, like, okay, well, most like successful people either have imposter syndrome or they're psychotic. Yeah. Like, it's basically, yeah. you know, it's basically one of those two things. You, yeah. They're psychopaths or they have imposter syndrome right. because it's an unreal thing, you know, regardless to do something, you know, exceptional in that way, you know, like to even dream that you can, to even, because if you do it, like the arrogance, this is what I think of about sometimes, because yeah. my story, I tell the story in this year's show about the first time I did Comedy America, because I've just more moved more permanently there, so, I, like I'm telling a story about what I'm doing right now, but I'm telling it through the context of something that happened 10 years ago, because yeah. I often find in reflection, it's a better way to talk about what you're doing now, rather than you know, you haven't had time to reflect on exactly what you're going through now. Yeah. So all those yeah. things go into it, which is, is fun. But um, I, uh, I I talk about the idea of my, I went to New York City and did stand-up, and that's what I wanted to do. Like, And it was a seven-minute open mic spot. But that, as much as I had a goal, as much as, like, you know, you talk about that idea of what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Like, I did it. I was a kid who grew up on a farm. There's like the roads named after my grandfather who built the road. My dad lives on the road. My brother is a farmer on that farm. So at some stage, when I was a kid on a country farm, who, whose family were all farmers and always had been farmers, I at some stage saw comedy on TV, and at least part of me inside my head went, "I reckon I could do that." I and isn't that. <laughs> that's but that's a weird thing for, like, if you think about it, that's just crazy. Yeah. Like, I have no right to think that. I was well, why say, I do you feel? Think, do you feel that, like, with your family, there's like the the what right do I have? You know, like to and does does that? I didn't even know anyone in show business. Yeah. I'd never met anyone in show business. The first person I met in show business was me. I think. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> like they, and so I've always taken it with me that. I've never felt special, right? Like, I don't think that I'm special. I don't think that, I rarely think that many people are particularly special. Obviously, some people have talents that help them, but a lot of the time, it's just someone who dreamt of doing something and wanted to do it and worked out how to do it and was able to work out a way to do it. And so I've always carried that with me a little bit that, like, you know, it's really, it's not, you're not special because you've been lucky enough to be able to you know, make your living doing something you really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it always, uh, like, I'm always reminded of the fact that, like, you know, at some stage you've just got to, I've got a tattoo on my arm. It's a, um, it's a jigsaw piece. And uh, it's, it's just kind of meant to remind me because, yeah, it's a blue jigsaw piece. Like, you know, like the worst jigsaws that are all ocean, right? Yeah, and you're yeah. like, well, <laughs> corners are and done and me, then what? Life yeah. to me is a little like that, like in the, I don't think there's any specific meaning to it. I think that the only meaning of life is the meaning that we give our own lives. But I also think that, you know what? That's what I think. Yeah. And that's and that's made me happy to think that. And the way that I live my life is guided by that. And I'm happy with that. But I don't really mind if other people want to live their lives in other ways if it doesn't you know, impinge in me living my life in the way that I want to live my life. Because who would I know? Like, I don't know. Yeah. But... This idea that, oh, well, I mean, like, it's hard for me to express exactly what I'm trying to say, but really is that I think that we give our own lives meaning every day mm -hmm. and I can choose to go on this journey and be this sort of person and do what I want to do 
and and that's fine. Like I don't as long as I as, as long as I don't like you know if I'm happy. Like I went to the movies three times last week. That makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. I like to have fun, but and, I can do things. And that you make can me. you can do it solo, can't you? You're you're, uh, you're happy to do that. Right, I can go to the movies by myself. I I realized that a few years ago that in what was important to me, and that's why we've got to realize what's important to you, what helps you guide your life, right? And for me, what I realized was I don't like people telling me what to do. Like that's to be honest. There's not an amount of money that like is worth someone telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. So I always get in these situations and the point where like I'd like to maximize my income and be able to earn my sort of living right up to the point that someone else tells me what I can do and what I can say. But yeah. that's my cutoff, right? Yeah. The minute that goes, well, how about we give you a bit more money and we can tell you what to say? I'm like, you know what? I've got, I've got enough money. Yeah. I'd rather have the money I have that is not that much money, but be able to say what I want to say and do what I want to do and make my podcast and talk about whatever I want to talk about in that. Like, I like the idea that I can have conversations about meaning and say to people, I don't know. Like, what do you, what do you think? Yeah. Like, like, but my gut instinct is it has no meaning, which is limitlessly encouraging because it means that we have the opportunity to make our own meaning every day yeah. and that doesn't just have to be a career thing that doesn't just have to be a kid from a farm can go off and be a stand-up comedian overseas it can literally be like you know what i'm going to do tomorrow i'm going to take my dog for a walk because you know what makes me really happy taking my dog for a walk around the harbor or you know what i'm going to do next week i'm going to go to that restaurant that I love. It's not even that expensive, but I just love it because it's, yeah, the food's always reliable and I yeah. sit in that booth in the corner and you know what I'm going to do on Sunday? I'm going to watch the football shows early in the morning and I'm going to read the Sunday newspapers and I'm going to drink a cup of coffee and I'm going to be happy. Now, if I did that every day, I wouldn't be happy yeah. because I have other things that, in, but I do think that it gives us the possibility to go, oh, 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 that's right. We can give our life the amount of meaning that we 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 want to. Yeah, I think sorry, that was rambly, but no, it's, it's no, no, no. I love that. There, there, was like, there was like five things, and I don't know what I want to grab from there, but like because I, because I don't have any philosophy, like a strict philosophy when it comes to this thing. Yeah. As soon as you start me talking about it, it becomes me just rant, going. Oh, and I think maybe this, and then but, this. Yeah, but that's like, and me and my girlfriend talk about that a lot, like. Uh, you know, it's it kind of any any form of ex, uh, extremism sort of weirds us out where people are like, you have to do this always. Like that is not, you know, that's not appropriate. And that that comes back to like not telling anyone else how to live their life. And and that's and that's cool. And and I think we're always so uh, like I'll know a lot of the times like I'll have to tell myself oh, I've had that back and forth in my head, being like that person they're not watching, they don't care. Like who cares? It's like. I'll be on the I'll be on the subway with my coffee and I'll be like I don't want to like I don't want to I don't want to drink like no one else is drinking their coffee I don't want to be like that person but it's like who who gives a shit like it's who it's shit. all you and it's just that that it's like the only person who is worrying about whether I'm going to drink this coffee or not because I might spill it I might be hot like I'm I'm wearing gloves is that appropriate on the in the subway but the only person that's worried is you like everyone else is worrying about their own shit and, and I'll do it like going to the coffee shop too. Like, um, I love my little coffee shop. It's run by a couple of guys who were in Melbourne. And so already there's that like connection for me, like being away from home and that that's there. And I'll be like, I'll go and I'll be like, ah, oh, I really feel like a coffee. It's like, I already went this morning. Like, what are they going to think? Like, uh, that I'm coming back twice in a day. Like they're going to think like I'm a hobo or I just left or, you know, it's, it's always that, uh, it's that. That, yeah, it's that little uh, inner monologue, that little critic that is just like, right. you've just left the restaurant, like you can't go back and use the washroom. You're like, no, I just paid like a hundred dollars for like this big meal. Of course I can go use the washroom. It's like, no, but you left. People don't leave the restaurant and then duck back in. You know, like it's like people don't, people yeah, don't but, do but that. But you're like at the restaurant, you don't need to pass out. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah. not Disneyland or something. Like yeah, once yeah. you're off the premises, yeah, it's... Yeah. But I agree with you entirely. In fact, I, I have – it's so weird because I'm trying to get over it. I'm so embarrassed about asking people about directions. And you travel a lot. Yeah. I know. And people don't mind. No, and I always have, 
And but I also have to do that thing of going, and if they don't know, you can ask another person, and it's not going to ruin their whole day, yeah. and it's going to be fine. And I think that we do that all the time. We're, we're our own worst enemies. And part of it is that, again, we think that we need to be as good as other people, but other people aren't as... The more that we can talk about... You know what I find fascinating yeah. is in a comedy room, mm -hmm. you can talk about, like, politics and it will divide the crowd, you know, but people are happy for you to talk about it. And, like, or you can talk about a topic that maybe 5% of the crowd would have nothing in common with, but people will enjoy it. But if you, say, brought up masturbation, for example, mm -hmm. like the crowd will, like, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Now, other than, say, breathing, it's probably, if you drew Venn diagrams, the one thing that most of the people in the crowd actually have in common. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everyone's been to Trader Joe's. Yeah. Not everyone's been on the plane. But most people in the room at some stage have probably done that. Yeah. Yet, we are so embarrassed about the things that we have in common, oh, yet yeah. we are so willing to ring a radio station and complain about loudly in public about the things that divide us. I find that fascinating as humans. I think sometimes we'd be much better if we kept some of this, some of that shit private and talked about the things we all have in common a bit more. Yeah, totally. It's that um, hypocrisy and, and uh, I know on uh, You Made a Weird, like Pete Holmes calls it, he always says like, that's my bullshit and I think that that yeah. is talking about that exact thing because it's like, I'm all for this, I'm all for this. And it's like, yeah, but I, but I do that. And it's just, it's being willing uh, to own up to that and be like, I, I'm, I'm definitely not perfect. And I'd love to be like, uh, be like the nicest person in the world. But it's like, I did, I did kind of a shitty thing. Like I always find it here. Like I feel so bad sometimes. It's like you hear people coming uh, up the corridor and we have, I live on the 19th floor. So it's like the elevator and it's just like, you know, I hear like a couple of dogs come through or whatever and it's the, the door's closing and I'm like, oh, do I, do I open it or not? And it's like, sometimes I open it and the people don't get in and then, you know, it's that feeling of like, oh, you get crushed because you're trying to do a good thing. I actually had a chat with my girlfriend about doing that today. There was a, there was a guy, um, we, were, we were having a sneaky pint uh, before I went and saw Second City actually in Toronto, which was sick. Um, and there was a guy who sat down and the server didn't come over um, to him, didn't see him in the corner, and so there was the there was the part of me going like, ah, oh, like, you know, this is what I want to do. Like, I'm compelled to just either like go take his money, which he has on the table, go buy him a pie, whatever he wants. But what I ended up doing is I went and just went to the server, and I was like, uh, there's a guy waiting. We're heading out the door. Still a nice thing, but it's like I yeah. chose that middle line, and and I'm like, I don't know, like. And I talked to my girlfriend, she's like, yeah, like, I'm glad you did that because she comes from a point where it's like, she just hates to be embarrassed and she hates rejection. And right. so we, we both had that. And so I picked that middle ground so that we were like, you know, we were both, both comfortable. But Well, because also you're in the world right then. And this is the thing that most people don't realize is when people have firm opinions about things is that at every stage you're in a different scenario because suddenly in that moment you're balancing not only that guy's situation which your initial instincts are going i'm going to do something friendly i'll take his money i'll get him a pint blah 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 but you're also balancing the fact that you're there with your girlfriend and yeah. presumably the two of you are trying to have a good time yeah. and you know that yeah. if you do that it's going to embarrass her and then suddenly you're taking some of the good out of that scenario yeah. so in that type case you kind of did the best of both worlds you know and you but screw up don't... and it's like it's the it's the owning up to the screw up and my girlfriend's gonna hate this but when i first got to town we went out for brunch um, which was awesome and we waited like half an hour to get into this really nice place she's like I want to take you here we sat down uh, at a table for four just the two of us next to each other and again it's like the you know I'm from Bendigo I feel like I'm a, I'm a country boy we have that in co common and then my my initial reaction is like this place is closing in half an hour there's still a massive line let's invite those people over and so that's, that's me doing my thing. But then my, like my girlfriend, you know, we've been apart for however many months and she just wants to hang out with me and she doesn't want right. to, she can't talk to strangers as easily as I can. And so it's, it's that funny, it's that balancing. And, and so we, we actually, I, I offered and the people said no. And then my girlfriend's like, see, that's why you don't ask. And I'm like, no, see, like, I'm, a, I think I'm at that point where I'm like, that's their loss, you know, like they feel maybe embarrassed, maybe, maybe they, maybe they're nice people and they're like, they want to approach, maybe they're like 
horrible people and they're like, we don't want to talk to other people. They're not good enough. Like whatever, you don't know. But the, the thing is like for me coming away, feeling good. Like that's right. the, yeah. Well, I think that you can only like, I think that you should try to be yourself as much as possible. I mm -hmm. think that's the first thing. But like, I also understand that idea of, I think that sometimes in life we have to think about what was our actual aim of this night? What yeah. were we actually trying to achieve? I always go back to this, this example, which is, I remember uh, Amy, my ex, and I were, um, eh, we hadn't caught up for a while, and uh, we were catching up this night, and the aim of the night was just to have a really, really nice night, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got a DVD, like it was a movie that I had seen, but a movie that I really liked, and she hadn't seen it, right? Nice. And so I thought, perfect, great, okay, this is what we'll do. We're just going to watch a movie, we're going to hang out, it's going to be fun. Anyway, for whatever reason, we put on the movie and then she was just fidgety, but not in a bad way. She was just getting up and doing things and then coming back. And I'm like the whole time kind of like starting to get frustrated. Like, you're not, you're not concentrating on the movie. Like this is a, why are you concentrate? Why aren't you concentrating on this movie? Yeah. But she's happy. She's just like flitting around, patting the cat, coming back. She's not having a bad time. In fact, she's having a good time, yeah. right? In that moment, I had to remind myself because I felt like I was going to say something, right? Mm. But here's, here's what the aim of the night was. The aim of the night wasn't to watch the movie, right? No. We weren't being tested on the movie afterwards. No, no. <laughs> right? The yeah. aim was to have a good time. Yeah. And that's all we were doing. She was having a good time. Mm -hmm. She was walking backward and forward, but she was having a good time. I was laying on a couch, like, watching a movie that A, I'd already seen before, so even if it, I was being distracted, it didn't matter. Yeah. B, that I, was, <laughs> that I, did, I should have just watched the movie, yeah. which is then what I ended up doing. But yeah. it was one of those things that if it had been 10 years earlier, you know, we would have started a fight because I would have been like, why are you watching the movie? And then she would have got angry because and then blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly, not only like, are you not having a good time, but you've ruined the night and the only idea of that night mm -hmm. was to have a good time. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that we often like will, you know, what do they cut off our nose to spite our face or whatever, yeah. you know, people say. But I do feel like if we just have an idea of what are we actually trying to achieve here? Yeah. And if you have a sense of like what you want to be and the person you want to be and like I was talking to my friend Justin Hamilton who's a really wonderful Australian comedian Super about nice. this, about this uh, just today. And he was saying about young comedians and we were talking, I won't name who it was, but a specific older generation comedian that I love from Australia. And I was talking to Justin about I'd run into this guy and how it's always such a wonderful thing to catch up with this particular guy. Yeah. And Justin said to me that the younger comedians like find him a bit standoffish. Right. And I was saying, I think that's just a generational thing because when we first came through, the older comics didn't really hang out or talk with yeah, the younger comics, they were different generations. Right. But because what we've tried to do, like, as we've gone through is always be in the, it was always important for me to give back to the scene, be in the scene, mm -hmm. you know, take younger people under your wing. You know, if someone needs to have a conversation with you about their show or about what they're doing, then try to find the time and try to do that because that's the industry that I wanted to be part of. And the Australian industry is small enough that, through a few of us wanting to do that, we've been able to over the years, not in a conscious way, but just in a, you know, let's go and watch those kids. And if they ask you for advice and plug them and make sure that they're having a good time and, you know, yeah. be a them to ask you questions and whatever, mm -hmm. which by the way, I learn as much out of every time I have one of those conversations yeah. as they do. It's like, At it's least a coach. Much. People say that about having like coaches and life coaches and stuff, how it's like the person who's really getting the most from it is the coach. Right. All the time. And yet, yeah. Right. But that's, uh, that is how it kind of feels. Like, I, you know, I, I, I learned from it. But I was just saying to Justin, we've, we've changed the culture of the industry a little bit. Mm. Not, not on purpose. That wasn't what we set out to do. Again, like, like, well, it com comes back to the very thing we were talking about in the first place, which yeah. is we didn't set out to change the culture of the industry. Yeah. We set out to do more gigs. We set out to be more encouraging. We set out to, you know, be inclusive and be there and, you know, have fun with this. But what it's resulted in is that's mm. now the way that that generation thinks that that's how most people behave. And so when they hit someone from an older generation, and chances are knowing this person I'm talking about, he's the most lovely guy in the world. So chances are the reason he's not 
talking to them or is standoffish is because he probably thinks they're looking at him like, who's this old guy, yeah, you know, yeah. here. It's his insecurity that he's projecting out. But because he does that, they get a standoffish. Yeah, so totally. if you just yourself, look, people can still not like you. Yeah. People can still but wouldn't it be better for someone not to like you? Well, here's, I guess, where it comes down to it. Some people, I was about to say this sentence, and I understand how flawed this will say to, sound to some people. Yeah. I was about to say, isn't it better for someone to not like you for who you are than someone you're pretending to be? And I yeah. think that's true, right? Yeah. I'd rather, it's always been my thing with TV and whatever. Yeah. I'll do it my way. If it fails, at least I did it my way because it would be nothing worse yeah. Than something failing when I was doing it someone else's way, totally. but but people when love I've that because that, there's that. always that there's always someone to to fall back on because if you don't do it your way, if you give up whatever to other people, it comes back to choosing what you want to do with your life. If you have someone to fall on the sword for you, it's like my boss told me that it's that shirking of responsibility. And it's like, you feel so safe because it's like, it's not going to be a real reflection on me. Like, yeah, I might get in trouble, but like someone else is going to take the real fall. And it's like, I can't be fully blamed because, you know, I'm, I was doing this to please my parents or like, you know, I was doing the right thing at the time. I, I was doing what I thought I had to do. It's like, it's it's that easy. Yeah. It's, it's But it's yeah. so hard though because but, it's raw. But, it's no, you. No, that's... And you're absolutely right. And, and that's why I paused when I was about to say it because I realized that what I was about to say is also the reason that people don't do it, yeah. which is people are like, well, what if people don't like me? Yeah. Yeah. Right? But surely... And, and as a performer... Internet, sorry, go. Finish. Well, I was just going to say, as a performer, like this show that I'm doing is a more personal show than I have ever done before. And what I mean by that is that it's just more reflective of who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And there have been some people, I think most people have really enjoyed it, but there's been a couple of people like, oh, you know, I wish it was more like this or I wish it was more political. I wish it was more like blah, blah, blah. And I have taken it a bit more personally because I'm like, oh, no, no, no. You're really yeah. saying you don't like me. This yeah. is this is me. If you don't enjoy this, I'm unapologetic about this. This is just 100% me. Yeah. Guess what? You, guess who you liked? You didn't like me. You yeah. looked. You liked a lie I was telling about me. Mm -hmm. You liked a version of me I was pretending to be. But this is actually me. And it does cut harder. And if you are yourself, but here's what I would say, is that I think that's still the best of those two choices. Yeah. It's still better to be yourself and have love, people love you for who you are. Because here's what I, here's what I reckon I do know is I think I'm an okay person and I've certainly met some really nice people mm -hmm. and they're all riddled with doubt. They all say terrible things all the time. They all think terrible things all the time. Yeah. I like to think I'm a pretty nice person and I have thousands of terrible thoughts every <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. imagine what the terrible people are thinking. Oh, my you know? God, yeah. So I yeah. kind of think that we shouldn't get bogged down in too much about what other people are going to think and, like, Worry about what will make us happy. And I think that that's never going to be one thing. It's going to be how you behave as a person, you know, how you are with your friends, like what you're like with your family. Did you cheat, lie, betray to get there? Do you care about those things? Are you interested in money? Are you interested in creativity? Oh, there's so many things that, that, and none of them are one size fits all. You've got to go there and you've got to work out, okay, well, you know what? Stability is this much important to me and yeah. creativity is this much important to me and stability and family and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, and that's not important to me at all. Oh, and that thing there that everyone thinks is, like, for example, one of the things for me that is really hard for me to admit, but is that I, I, I never, because I'm not that well known. Like, you know, comedians aren't that well known in Australia, as you know. <laughs> like, um, but... I never noticed until I moved to America how much of my day, even two or three people a day wanting to say good day and getting a photo or stop while you're having a coffee or not even like the stuff that you like, I, 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 you rarely go down the street in your tracksuit pants, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then going to somewhere like America where no one knows me at all and I can just be myself 100% of the time and be in my own world. Yeah. I mean, that's been worth a lot of like – if I could take one of those things, if I could get all the other things that I wanted and yeah. keep one of the things, the idea that I could go down the street and like, because I don't like that bit of it. I mean, I like I like engaging with someone if they want to say something nice about the show or whatever, but I was never doing this so that people would know who I am because, because I like being private. 
I like going to the movies by myself. Mm -hmm. I like walking around in my tracksuit pants and eating a meal by myself without somebody thinking that I'm a loser because I'm in. Like, I like those things, you know? So it, it, I think that you've got to think about what is good for you yeah. and what, what, what do you want your world to look like and then how can I manifest my world to look like that because, you know, the things that make you happy, you know, are day to day and, mm -hmm. and if you don't think about that, if you, if you are that person who's like, no, I'm just going to, you know, live in a crap house in the suburbs for 40 years so when I'm 65 I can finally pay it off and then die. I mean, that's fine if that's your choice, but, yeah. you know. But that's so much. Uh, like two two things on that, and and they I really feel like they come together. I'm not going to take too much more of your time, uh, Mr. Will Anderson. But with the travel thing, I always hate that um, when people are so I don't hate it. It's like it's brutal because I don't hate the person, but they go travel. They do you know they do the Southeast Asia trip with their friends, and they're so free, and they try new things, and it's fantastic. Then they come home and do the same shit. And that's, right. that's what I hate. And, and what you're talking about there is where you go and no one, you don't know anyone. It's like, I did the same thing here. It's like all of a sudden, like I've got a new, like I can, I'm the same person that I was back in Melbourne. But for some reason here, it's like, you know, like no one knows me. So it's just, it is, it's so freeing. And, and if, you're right, if you could take that and have that in your, like, you know, your every day, that's, that's the, I don't know, that's the gimmick. But I think that's, that's what I'm trying to get to as well. And that comes back to that inner monologue and the critic and stuff. But the other thing I was going to say is, and I think you might've found this with the internet. Like if you are just you, like people are going to come out of the woodwork and, and, and love you. Like people, I just, I, I think that like, there's just that, that's what the world is. There's all those niches and someone's going to like your shit. Like, your YouTube channel might be like hitting a ping pong ball up and down, but like someone's going to be like, that is the raddest thing in the world. Like there is someone, there's always that audience. And I think that is the coolest thing I've found uh, about the internet as well. You find other people like me and you're like, oh, like they're weird and they're crazy. But if you grow up in a small town and you're the weirdo and everyone else is like, like that, you, you just like, well, there's something wrong with me. I'm going to, I'm going to act the way, you know what I mean? There's, there's no gratification yeah. for, for oh, being you. I understand completely what you mean. And the other thing like about life that we should always remember is like when when you're thinking about these sort of things is guess guess who my favorite band in the world and guess who my favorite comedian in the world and guess who my, you know, none of these people are the biggest like, you know, in the world. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite things are not the most popular restaurant in the world or my favorite food would be fucking McDonald's. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the most popular comedian in the world. I don't know who that is, but it, like, it's not. Yeah, that's not who my favorite comedian is. My favorite band isn't the biggest band in the world. My favorite podcasts aren't the biggest podcasts in the world. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I love them. Like, I, there's podcasts I listen to. There's an Australian politics one called Something Wonky, which I imagine has probably less than 5,000 subscribers. I might be wrong. I'm like, I, I don't want to demean the good name. <laughs> something wrong. Dear I, Will I, Anderson. One of the things about having crappy internet over the last three weeks was, because it's also like it's a homemade you know, podcast and it goes for a long time, it was taking me like a day to download episodes of it when I was on tour, but I would yeah. every week because I just really enjoyed that podcast. It yeah. works for me. You know, my favorite bands in the world aren't the biggest bands in the world, but it does not make me love their music any less. Yeah. It does not make me, you know, in fact, sometimes it makes me love that stuff more. So this idea that, you know, that something has to be perfect, like sometimes the imperfections or the, you know, the, sometimes the thing you like it about it is the thing that they're prob you're probably sitting there going, oh, no, people hate me about this or whatever. Yeah. It's Yeah, totally, yeah. like being kooky and, uh, you know... I yeah, it's it's crazy, and and, and it, so much of it comes back to like what other people think too. It's just like oh, it's like you have that on your iTunes, and it's like ah, oh, it's got so many plays. It's like oh, you know, it must be my sister. I remember saying that. I don't know who it was. I think it was like something terrible, like the Veronicas. You know what I mean? But I really, I play drums, and it's like I really there's, there's just something about that, and and then someone's just like they did my uh, you know, it was like a playlist, and it was like. I don't know. It was something. It was something silly, like fifty plays for the Veronicas, and I was like, "Oh, like what are you gonna think of me?" But the thing is, it's it's just that there's another like thing that's thrown around a lot. Um, it's not a bad thing. It's that vulnerability. It's like being you, but it's like 
for every like hidden like desire that you have like someone else has got got something as well like it, it might be a fetish but they're just like as soon as you admit that and i think if they're this kind of person that i want to be around they'll come back with two things i'll be like i, lo- right. I still listen to the venga boys you know still waiting for the venga bus to arrive <laughs> It's coming. It's coming. No, but I agree with you entirely. Like, I mean, I find it amazing in my show. Like, I'll, you know, I'll talk about something like having osteoarthritis in my hips or whatever. Yeah. But that's a not many of my audience are actually going to be sitting there with osteoarthritis in their hips. But everyone's, you know, been through some health thing or feel like they're getting older or has not been able to do something yeah. or has felt embarrassed or has been in the like. If you connect on a human level, that's the. That's the, the, the it should at least be the starting point. Yeah, but that's that's like to, to wrap this up. Like that's the failure thing. It's like I I kind of have no trouble uh, telling people about the project, and I haven't had really anyone be like that sounds like shit. And if they did, it, it, they're probably like a hater or a troll or jealous or whatever their reason for it is. Well, because either way, it doesn't matter. Is doesn't, the point. Yeah. I, that, that's the thing that I almost think that we need to get to with like the hater troll blah 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 yeah. it's like we don't even need to label these people yeah. or give them like you know all you need is a certain amount of people to like what you do and then anyone who doesn't anyone who's not involved is actually they're all irrelevant yeah. whether they're just mildly not into it or whether they hate it more than anything yeah. to be honest all you're making something for is the people who like it and the people who want to enjoy it. Yeah. That's all you should be concentrating on, making better stuff for the people who enjoy it. And I could not go an entire podcast without quoting Batman. Yeah, so please, please. I think the most important thing for everyone to remember is, why do we fall, Bruce, so we can learn how to pick ourselves back up again? Oh, boom. <laughs> I actually, I was setting up a light for this uh, for the interview, and last night I was shining it outside so that the, the smokers wouldn't fall off our balcony, uh-huh. um, 19th floor to their death. But it was so funny, I put the little spotlight up, and it was the perfect little uh, round circle, and I was like... I'm going to put a little uh, little fat symbol and shone it up. My girlfriend, the worst thing is my girlfriend had no idea what it, what it was. She was like, what is, what is that? I was like, it's a bat symbol. He's like, no. And then I showed the iPhone. iPhone. She's like, it looks nothing like that. I was like, I tried. Okay. I tried. Uh, no, the next it, one would be better. Close. You would have got the DC lawyers around, so yeah, <laughs> yeah on my ass. Um, Will, did you want to? Did you want to add anything um, to? I feel like that was, that was fun. I feel yeah, Thanks, that bro. was that was amazing. Uh, hopefully, like all the technology has worked. I think the the levels and stuff have been fine. You know firsthand how scary it can be until it's uploaded. You're about to say, you know firsthand how terrible technology can be. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing with my podcast even is that like goes back to what you were saying before about like if we had waited to get the sound perfect before we started doing it, yeah. we would have only started it about six weeks ago. Totally, <laughs> you know? totally. But you also see, and I'm sorry, to, I don't want to do a new point, but just on that, um, I know someone, I did, I did a podcast about podcasting because I like to be meta as shit, but... Uh, I was talking to yeah, the guy. Like how you're failing at your failure oh, project. Dude, it's, That's it's, meta. It's not irony. It's, it's meta. It's, meta. it's super yeah. meta. Fifth wall. It's, um, it's good. It's, I hate myself. No, <laughs> uh, I was talking to, I was talking to uh, this guy, Brian, and he was saying, um, you know, his idols and stuff, Any anything, if it's a band, if it's a podcast, you, for how awesome it is now and 10,000 hours, it's like everyone started – at a point where it was like shitty and inaudible and you made like terrible jokes and you got the lighting all wrong and the camera was shaky, but you you don't get to that nice polished product and and maybe polished life without starting it, you know, at a, and it sounds like it was recorded on a brick in an oven. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you got to break it apart again to make it interesting again because when it gets too safe, then, you know, it gets boring. So... Anyway, we've got to stop talking. There's a fight you, my man. In situation. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Good luck with the rest of the, the Thank festival, you so my much. man. Um, I'll get this up as soon as possible. Um, no and uh, yeah, good luck in Melbourne, Sydney, and uh, I'll put up as many links and interwebby stuff as I can. Awesome. Cool. Good to see you. Thanks, my man. Cheers. Peace out. Bye bye.